Radio Free Sparrow. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Radio Free Scar, episode number 749. I am Stephen in Edmonton. Born in Vancouver. And Chris in Edmonton. It, uh, it's the last uh, episode of June 2020. That means that this year is, uh, can you believe it, over half over now. Mm-hmm. Nope. Including, well, this year the, or eon. Uh, including uh, the decade that was March. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, boy, uh, the new normal is fun, isn't it? Isn't it just nope. great? No, it um, is not. To answer your no, <laughs> no, it is very poor. Uh, especially, f- you know, those of you in the United States, where the COVID nineteen numbers are just shooting up and up. It's great. It's fantastic. Yeah, Florida. Well, there's no problem in Florida. What are you talking? No, about? open everything. Masks are for losers, apparently. Uh, our our best wishes to all our American friends who are coping yes, with stay all safe. this. Um, Wear a mask. You know, we know we don't tell you this, but come on. Uh, yeah, but you know, as I said last week, I I have the the face shield because the mask fogs up my glasses and doesn't stay on my ears and stuff, and and it it seems to be working fine. Um, so it's 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 a thing. It's a thing. Do do wear them. You're gonna have to take care of yourselves basically because your government isn't going to do it for you. So, <laughs> but more more importantly, by taking care of yourself, you're taking care of everyone around you as well. Exactly. Listen to this Canadian-based Doctor Who podcast for health advice. <laughs> Where none of and us inter- are, are none of us are remotely near medical professional level. And international oh. opinions too, from the yes. country that brought you sitting there and watching everybody else do stuff. Yeah. Um. So, uh, with that said, um, with numbers shooting up in the United States and the border remaining closed between our two countries and the EU removing American citizens from their fly list uh, when it's uh, revealed that so Americans can't fly to Europe, basically. Uh, Gallifrey won, uh, the hotel block of which sold out at about 45 minutes by the time every last uh, room was, was gobbled up, because that's still a thing. Um, the, the hotel block selling out uh, in rapid succession. Um yeah, it's uh, it 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 felt different this time to quote a certain oh, yeah. doctor in his final moments. Um, I know, like uh, looking, just gauging reactions on on Facebook and Twitter from friends, and just uh, even the 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 number of people talking about it after it was all uh, after all the dust had settled. The number of people talking about it was just seems so much lower this year, and it's not like you know a lot of a lot of people. I, uh, I, I would normally hang out with her, see whatever their head said. Yeah, I got a room, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but there's, yeah, just, I don't know. There's a little bit of a bit of a uh, downturn in the enthusiasm. A wee bit, because you know we're not sure if it uh, if what the world will be like in February uh, yeah. to be able to even go to this. Um, yeah. You know, and and conventions and ge- gatherings in general, especially down in the United States. I mean, you know, here in Canada, we're opening up a lot more um, with relative success. I haven't n- really noticed that much of a of an uptick in in cases <laughs> as we gradually sort of reopen. Well, Ed- 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 Edmonton has had quite an uptick. Since they have an uptick. Edmonton had an uptick, but it's it's been it's been sourced to two family gatherings about three or four weeks ago, uh, and that's basically where the the hot spots were. I mean, there's only like two hundred and forty seven ish active cases in Edmonton now. They used to be like you know fifty or something like that. I'll tell you um, one thing. I live downtown Vancouver, and I see a lot less people acting like there's a pandemic. <laughs> I'm like, guys, it's, it didn't go away. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, still there. It's still, it's still there. there. Yeah. It's still, like like taking. Taking public transit, for example, it, the the number of people, the number of people wearing masks or trying to remain distant, which is really really tough on a bus or a train, obviously. Uh, but even just the number of people wearing masks is is um, decre- decreasing on a now, very I very gotta, rapid level. I got to yeah. give praise to most, if not all, retailers I've seen. They're all being very responsible. Oh, I think they're more or less required to, but I know. Oh I, yeah, I, I know, do. but they are. Yeah. I do appreciate it. Um, yeah, it's uh, it was it was it was weird. I mean, 
I don't know. It it's I mean, where where will conventions be? I mean, who knows? I mean, I was actually t- I'm talking to friends uh, last night on Zoom, of course, and. I'm I, I'm saying like you know I, I know uh, Dr. Fauci in the U.S. is saying like he he seems fairly confident the the basically the one competent member of the the uh, uh, federal we found him uh, the only one res- response to this uh, is that he seems confident that a vaccine would happen by the end of the year or early next mm-hmm. and I've started to move like you know I have some projects as I'm sure we all do they get hey look at this we're in quarantine now I can do all these things and I bet you eighty percent of you haven't done those things yet. <laughs> And I'm starting to think, and I, and I'm like at the point where, um, I, I'm not optimistic, uh, for a vaccine, but I am less pessimistic. And so what I want to do is like, I, I'm sort of like, I need to finish a couple big projects that I had in mind to do, uh, so that when uh, like let's say like september out of like you know nowhere people say oh by the way we look at this the vaccine's being created and then like so many people are gonna go ah oh, geez i thought i had months i thought i had months to finish <laughs> this thing so my my goal is to be completely bored for the last two to three weeks before the <laughs> vaccine is available so that i'll feel confident in myself that i've done everything that i intended to do when i had all this time in my hands so uh, well, as as somebody who recently picked up and started playing Animal Crossing, uh, man, right. there's a lot of stuff I want to do that I don't have time for. <laughs> well, you're because you're back at work now. I mean, I'm still working at home, so like I still have all this time. And I was like, well, I grabbed Grand Theft Auto for the umpteenth time on PlayStation because it was dirt cheap, and I'm playing for PlayStation Online anyway, and I'm playing the single player because I can't get enough of it. And yeah. I'll that with The Witcher, which is also dirt cheap on the PlayStation Store. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so how that ties into conventions, I don't know. I feel like I'm going to have time. Like I, I, you know, Chicago TARDIS hasn't, uh, announced any guests or intentions or, or what they might plan to do for November. That's the, the next big one that I can think of. Um, yeah. I know, uh, uh, Atlantic came back for one more year. They, they, for the virtual thing. Yeah. Virtual thing. I, I don't know. If, uh, virtual things. I mean, you know, there, there were a couple of virtual things that happened this past week, like, uh, the, uh, HBO Max and BBC America, um, were promoting the, um, uh, series one through 11 of Dr. Who on, uh, on uh, on a big thing, and they had like you know with uh, Jody Whittaker, um, Matt Smith, and David Tennant together on a, on a big Zoom call. Uh, Riley Sibmer, our good friend Riley, uh, also did one for Nerdist with them as well. Like that, like that's that's the extent of these sort of Zoom things. I mean, late night talk shows are mm-hmm. are Zoom based now, but I feel like I don't know, like the the heyday of the Zoom weekend convention sort of happened in the very early days of the lockdown. Well, it, and it did. I feel like they, I feel like they haven't really been a thing. Well, since Worldcon then, is you know? going to go virtual, uh, and yeah, and I was and I was like, well, I was planning to go to New Zealand. Now that's not happening. But I, I don't know if I can much. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Muster up the gumption. I was said munching up the guster for <laughs> one for 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 because it's the other side of the world. It's the same price, uh, yeah. and the timing is all wrong. So I'm, am I yeah. going to bother? I don't know if I will. Well, that's that would be the hardest part from Canada from doing virtual stuff is like if you're in if you're in New Zealand at at the venue and whatever then cool you got a panel at two o'clock cool it's at two o'clock mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know what that's going to be for you in Vancouver now now I I would have my caveat for that is I went to CanCon last year which is sort of the uh, Canadian literary sci fi version of WorldCon ish um, and I can't recommend it enough by the way if you're in the Ottawa area it's great it's the only convention I've ever been to where every panel I'm like I had to choose between two as opposed to uh-huh. eh, whatever <laughs> so so they're they they haven't said if they're doing virtual or not um, but if they are doing virtual I would have no qualms with writing off a weekend and just watching panels all weekend you're right my point is though like is you know the novelty of a zoom like oh, everyone's yeah. sort of like like everyone's work meetings are over zoom. Everyone's like, uh, like friend meetups are over zoom. Like everyone yeah. feels like, like we're kind of done. I just I mean, now saw some sitcom they want to do over zoom. And I'm like, mm, yeah, nobody's going to care by the time this is done. Well, mm-hmm. sta- staged worked as, as a thing for yeah. six, yeah, but, six, but in six months, we're going to be sick and tired. Of, we're, I'm getting sick and tired of looking at zoom myself for work. <laughs> so I mean, sure. Yeah. But I mean, the things, things like the, the, the succession of, uh, virtual things that, that Phantom did back in March, April, May, mm-hmm. whatever it was. Yeah, they did great. Great it's, work. Like it's it's awesome, awesome stuff. But there is absolutely the question of of uh, virtual burnout. Yeah, or burnout over virtual stuff. Mm-hmm. And I I didn't really watch much of any of those. I watched bits and pieces here and there, but 
could I sit down and do it for a whole weekend? I, I no, I don't think so. <laughs> when you're and, and I, like, I've I've done probably fewer Zoom calls than you guys have. So. Yeah, you know, when you're required to sort of like sit in your your chair at home, like I'm always here. Like that, this is the problem. But we're we, we're 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 stuck inside, and we can't. Yeah. You know, in terms uh-huh. of work, go on. In terms of work, I've right. I've covered several Zoom conferences, but that's different. I'm sitting there doing the exact same thing I would have anyway, taking notes and then writing a story about it. Yeah, <laughs> right. So it doesn't it's, really. It's, it's a work conference. Easier in a yeah. way. So it's because I don't have to fly anywhere, get a hotel, or any of that stuff. So so in yeah. a way, that's not so bad. Yeah, like conventions. I mean, the social aspect of conventions are. The big draw of conventions, mm-hmm. essentially. Yeah, you know, at a work uh, conference, I just go right back to my hotel room and write these things. So, yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so, it is very difficult to replicate that in a like imagine LobbyCon as a Zoom call. It's just like no, it no. doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. Um, no, it doesn't. So, yeah, conventions will have an interesting, interesting time of it. I think uh, over the next few months. So, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, in, in the weeks and months to come, but the hotel block for for one for Gala for one is at least uh, sold out. So, yeah. um, for for whatever it's worth, just to put it back out there, right. uh, even though the Marriott is sold out, there are still a bunch of nearby hotels. The and and getting rooms is probably not a big deal, uh, but uh, anyone who, anyone who is booking, uh, uh, just uh, err on the side of caution. Make sure you have something where you can cancel it in advance yes. without being on the hook for any any payment. Yes, yeah. Like I, I booked a I booked a room at the Hilton a few weeks ago, just as a as a precaution, which I'm gonna give away or cancel or whatever. Uh-huh. But uh, I made sure that it it or anything else I considered was something I could I could cancel without being on the hook for a night's payment or or whatever. Mm-hmm. I also see that uh, that airline companies, um, just strictly strictly speaking, in Canada anyway, uh, uh, Air Canada and WestJet are are removing the um, the distancing measures that they sort of had put in oh. place, uh, and putting basically your your they've looked at they're, they're following the WHO uh, guidelines on this now. Basically saying, yeah, it, when you're in the plane, the air is going to get around. I mean, it's not it's it's droplets, it's not air, and so guess what? You're sitting next to. Uh, a person for the entire flight. But here's the catch. We won't serve you anything because we can't. So basically sit there with your mask on, hungry and thirsty because we can't feed you or or anything. So like Hmm. air travel is like, now we're in that limbo zone. Like, okay, we haven't solved this thing yet, but we are going to take you places. We're going to take you places on the plane, but you can't actually go anywhere either. So like- I I did like when somebody said, is the glamour of air travel gone forever? Like, um, what is this from 1970? (laughs) Have you been on a flight or an airport recently? There is no glamour. I, uh, yeah, I didn't think about that, but uh, yeah, I guess Mm. with the way they recirculate the air that, uh, whoever you're sitting next to, you're technically sitting next to everybody at the same time. Pretty much. Pretty much. So if you're flying for whatever reason that you're flying, uh, wear a mask on the plane. I imagine you actually are required to do that anyway when you get on the plane. Yeah, I think you are. Yeah. yeah. I've heard... I don't know how true they are, but I've heard rumblings that like flights over or under certain lengths have different requirements than than others. And oh, I really? Know. Wow. I don't. I don't know what. I don't know what's actually true because I've I've no plans to fly anytime soon, so I've done no yeah, research as to what it's like. So yeah. Uh, happy fun days. Um, we uh, so we'll. We'll move on to Doctor Who Victor- Time Lord Victorious, uh, which of course we talked about. We talked about every single week because I think they basically announced a new thing for it. This uh, this massive spawn of a Doctor Who story across multiple platforms. Well, Doctor Who magazine is getting in on the act, uh, contributing uh, to it via its comics, starting with issue five fifty six, which is like three issues hence, I believe. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so that's the thing. Doctor Who magazine it- itself came out. Um, the, this past week with uh, with an <laughs> archive interview with uh, with John Pertwee and Elizabeth Sladen on set of Death of the Daleks from 1973. A couple fans went there and, and interviewed them, and, and they handed the audio over. There's also a great early pic of Peter Capaldi and his friend coming down to uh, London about 1973, mm-hmm. around that same time. There's an awesome, which I haven't read yet, but Emma Reeves, who uh, I met at Gallifrey One, uh, wrote a uh, Doctor Who directing masterclass article, um, followed by several seven different uh, modern series directors offering their take as well. So there's a whole chunk of Doctor Who directing in this um, this issue of Doctor Who magazine, and they're um, all they're all like like powerhouse directors as well. Like they've they've got 
distinct styles. Yes. Like you look you look at their stuff and you're like, okay, that's a Graham Harper episode or that's a Ta- Rachel Talley episode. And, yeah. And they're all, yeah, they're, they're like amongst the cream of the crop for people to talk to. They are. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm still happy with, uh, with, um, uh, Doctor Magazine. You know, by the way, we mentioned Phantom Films earlier, who put on those uh, awesome weekend conventions, and uh, and Doctor Who Magazine as well. I mean, these are these are tough times for a lot of uh, providers and stuff like that. So, if you could support, if you have it in your in your abilities to to support Doctor Who Magazine and, and Phantom Films, uh, do give them. Uh, they have some great stuff. Phantom Films, of course, has all those Toby Haydock uh, alternate commentaries that he's been cobbling together. I have a couple of those. And uh, Doctor, uh, I've subscribed to Doctor Who Magazine for like oof, three or four years now, I think, just online, like just the, the digital version. Well, the, um, since, since they went to digital, it makes it so much easier for people who aren't in the UK. So Yeah. I, it's, it's, <laughs> actually, it's actually worth considering. It really is, yeah. So I, I I enjoy it. So so do I mean it's been around since 1979, and I imagine the magazine industry is like, okay, how do we how do, you know how how do we survive at all this? Um, and they yeah. do amazing work. There, there's almost honestly, there's almost too much in each issue of Doctor Who magazine. It's like it feels almost overwhelming at times. But there's this is not a, a good. That's a good problem to have. Yeah. There's even a, the fact of fiction this week is Cold War, and uh, you know we'll be um, we we I say that because we've watched it recently for the uh, upcoming Douglas McKinnon miniscope. So it's it's almost like they've taken the leads from us. They haven't. They planned these things months in advance. But uh, <laughs> well, we also conversely stuff. did not steal anything from them. No, not at all. Because how could we? We've recorded it already, exactly. so we can't. Yeah, um, the uh, Doctor Who Worlds Collide is the escape room, right? The escape room that uh, that is is if you're in the UK, you could actually go to, but you can't right now because there's a global pandemic on. But now they've launched, or they will be launching rather, a remote experience powered by Zoom. So you and a bunch of friends get together on Zoom. Mm-hmm. You pay your money and you play this escape room virtually online the way the way the description is written it sounds like there's a person in the room and you just tell them what to do that's amazing <laughs> that's a job i want i just want so, a person like a bunch but, of eight, eight eight nerds yelling in my ears about what to do yeah, that sounds, what am i doing what you know am what i doing that sounds like that sounds like hosting a podcast <laughs> that does it's that just actually. delayed that's so my life before, that's my life actually yeah before we started recording we we're talking about the fact that this costs 60 pounds mm-hmm. to play and I got to think that over and above, like, you know, the, the cost to make the room and have the facility or whatever, a lot of that money hopefully is going to the person you are, quote unquote, controlling. <laughs> Probably. They, yes. they got to get paid. This the is sounding a little controller. most dangerous game-ish. A little bit, yeah. Kind of fun. I've never done an escape room. Um, and when they I, announced this initially, I, I was intrigued by it. But I've, I've never done one either, but uh, when... Uh, when Kat and I were planning our trip to Britain, which was supposed supposed to be late March, early April, um, mm-hmm. we were going to be in Manchester for a time, and uh, I forget which one it is. Uh, one of the escape rooms was was at the time anyway still in operation in Manchester, so we had we had plans to go, but uh, mm-hmm. that uh, never happened. That never happened. So, but now you can do it virtually if you wish. Um, no, thanks. I mean, fun. more power to anybody That's who wants to do it. But again, here. like, you yeah. want to talk? You want to talk Zoom fatigue? Do I want to pay sixty pounds to have Zoom fatigue? <laughs> no. To basically reenact the Blair Witch Project from the inside out. Uh, nah, no thanks. Uh, yeah, it's a good point. Well, it's there. It's there for you. Blair Witch Project. Keep it. It's there. I mean, uh, you got to. You know, I I uh, I applaud their their um, efforts to to you know keep the thing going because mm-hmm. it's very tough to keep anything going these days and, and you know, more power to them but that's not something I'm going to put money down for there you go ringing endorsement everyone there you go escape room <laughs> you can clip that clip that bit and use it on any media that you want to use to promote the uh, Doctor Who escape room that's on us that's for free we give you that one for free <laughs> Uh, let's talk about some big finish stuff. Uh, big boy, a big finish made a splash. Uh, the tenth Doctor and River Song together for the first time since uh, I've seen 2008 um, with uh, uh, Science in the Library. Uh, David Tennant, Alex Kingston in Big Finish uh, stories. Uh, four of them, three of them, uh, all recorded during the the lockdown. They uh, both um, 
uh, the Big Finish posted pictures of uh, of uh, of uh, DT and AK. Uh, <laughs> AK does not work. <laughs> recording in their own environment with uh, Alex Kingston with this amazing like uh, painting of like a bowl or something on on her wall. She was recording. Uh, you can tell that David Tennant probably records uh, a lot of audiobooks and stuff because he's got a pretty pro little setup going on there in his house. But uh, um, so that's cool. also a special appearances by Peter Davison and Colin Baker as uh, unsurprisingly as the fifth and uh, sixth doctors who, so, um, <clears throat> pre-order it's, uh, you can get pre-order now and it's out in November of 2023 stories, uh, featuring those, those two fine cats. David Tennant's all over doctor who these, you know, he's, even when he's in that, uh, that stage, you can see the TARDIS in the background, uh, in his garden. So like <laughs> he can never leave. He's, he left doctor who 10 years ago, 10 years yeah. ago, yeah, but he loves it. I don't know if you've had a chance to watch that HBO Max interview thing, but he's actually asked about that. Um, so he, he about it being how, ten years. Uh, no, about the the uh, TARDIS in his, in his back garden. <gasps> ah, cool. Uh, and, and apparently it was a what did he say? It was a, a gift from his kid's step grandfather. Um, That's just Peter Davison, isn't it? I don't know. I don't. Uh, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I just assume everyone's Peter Davison. I'm so confused by that family. Like, who is it? Is the dog? But uh, he, he was saying Baker? that his. His, his kids, he didn't say how many or which ones, but some of the kids at any rate were into Doctor Who for a very short time. So oh. so they got gifted this this TARDIS that ended up in the back garden and then the kids stopped liking Doctor Who, but the TARDIS. And now they play Fortnite. Yeah. Probably. Probably. Um, also from, uh, from Big Finish, uh, Gallifrey Time War. Time War is also uh, coming out in February of 2021. So when Gallifrey 1 would uh, when happen. Uh, Richard Armitage, uh, Thor and Oakenshield himself, is, uh, is playing Rassilon in, uh, in these, which is pretty amazing stuff. Um, so that's pretty cool. February 2020, uh, Time War 4 coming out. Uh, Torchwood Soho, a, a Torchwood spinoff. Set in the 1950s, they're set to debut in uh, in August. That's kind of neat. There's a bunch of people with rakish 1950s hats on in the uh, oh, yeah. in the cover art. 1950s. That's a cool time period and stuff. Uh, so that's uh, that's also coming from from Big Finish, where they love stories. Um, <laughs> I hadn't heard. Yeah, Michael Michael Herbert uh, wrote a, a an article called "Doctor Who and the Communists." It's all about Malcolm Hulk. I think I, t- I think we talked about him back. Uh, we did. At, we talked at, about it back. In, um, I just love the title, yeah. "Doctor Who and yeah. the Communist." And, yeah, Doctor Who 12, is a communist. Twelve and a half years ago, it wasn't that long, but it was a long time ago. And anyway, he he has expanded that short essay into a much larger forty. What would you say? Forty thousand words. Uh, he went from five five thousand words to forty thousand words, which is like practically novel length. That's a novel length. That's a biography, basically, of, of Malcolm Hulk. Anyway, uh, and he's and he's posted it on on his blog. So there you go. Have at it. It's free. You can read it. Uh, uh, and there's there's also an accompanying um, uh, online talk that he was a part of um, with uh, several other notables uh, talking about Malcolm Hulk and his and his history of the Communist Party and just you know Doctor Who as well. So um, yeah, interesting stuff. Uh, that's a that's a heck. That's a heck of a of an epic tome that uh, yeah. they just contributed to there. Well, that's, one that's one big thing about Hulk is, um, so he, I mean, he did five Doctor Who stories. He died in the late seventies, but there's a lot of lot of work that uh, he did that was just like un, a lot of people don't know about. And he's no, very, all his pre Doctor Who stuff, basically. Yeah, he's, he's he's like a super interesting cat. Um, very. And uh, and I remember because we had, I know I had Kyle on when we did the. Uh, mini scope about Hulk, mm-hmm. and then our friend John Williams was also writing that book, which I can't remember if it ever got published or not. No, no, I never published never it. Did. I think he did contribute a, a big thing to Doctor Who magazine, though, whatever it was. But uh, that's good. But uh, yeah. there's there's been some stuff written about the guy, and, and uh, to the best of my recollection, like even unearthing some of the information was tough. Mm-hmm. And even finding, a, I think there are like two pictures that exist of Malcolm Hulk because I only ever see those two pictures. Well, ever. if you're being hounded as a communist, you try to keep your profile low too. <laughs> in the Halcyon days well, the, of the 1960s and 70s. Yeah. The 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 talk this linked in the show notes has Katie Manning uh, on there as well, uh, <laughs> voice only because uh, she I guess recently had a uh, eye problem, eye infection, or something like that, so she didn't didn't want to do visuals uh uh-huh. stuff so i don't blame her but anyway uh having having done three i guess hulk stories and having met him she 
offered her opinion on him. So, oh, interesting. Or her recollections well, of him. Yeah, links in the show notes at that. Uh, that was just uh, a couple weeks ago. That uh, that online chat was so. Um, yeah, have a have a read, have a read, and have a listen. All about Malcolm Hulk. So thanks, uh, Michael Herbert, for uh, for letting us know about that. Um, uh, the final item in the news last is not Doctor Who specific, but it is it's always Doctor Who related because I always uh, associate Red Dwarf with Doctor Who because it was like the sort of the un, you know the unnatural successor because it was BBC made science fiction uh, that was made more or less after Doctor Who and of course aired about the same time for us. Anyway. Um, the uh, the Promised Land, which is a one off movie, is is coming to BritBox, and uh, our friend Kyle Anderson, who you just mentioned, Chris, uh, actually did the um, an interview with them online to promote this. Um, Has it already been recorded? I don't know. I don't know if it's been recorded, but it will be a thing. It's, that will be yeah, happening. there's a um, part of Comic Con at, yeah. at home, as they're calling mm-hmm. it. Yes, Comic Con at home. So uh, as part of that, uh, next month um, there'll, there'll be an online thing. So yeah, it comes to BritBox July twenty sixth, and uh, and Kyle will be, will be moderating this uh, online chat with the cast of uh, of Red Dwarf. So wonder if that'll go to BritBox too after the thing gets released. Wouldn't surprise me. Uh, as I said, uh, Red Dwarf: The Promised Land, as I just said, Warren is coming no, no, to BritBox. No, yes, yes I know that. Sense. I know that. I'm saying will Kyle's interview also appear on BritBox? Like, oh, I thought oh, you like meant like the answer series. Yes. Probably. Uh, you know not. what? You know what? It might just because his his uh, interview panel at Comic Con with like Peter Davis and Colin Baker and and I think Sophie Aldred from like three or four years ago is available to watch on BritBox. So there it you go. very See, well oh. might be on. Yeah, it's there. It's part of the thing. You watch okay. like the additional content. There's like Adventure in Space and Time. There's the Doctors Revisited, which is a great series from when from 2013. And then there's Kyle's panel from from BritBox. Yeah. From, yeah. See. Yeah. yeah. So maybe it will. Maybe it will. Our 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 friend Kyle Anderson is like a star on BritBox, basically. <laughs> He's an honorary yes. sandbagger. Yeah. <laughs> that too. That too. All of the sandbaggers. Anyway. Um, that's it. Uh, that's it for our news, everyone. Uh, we didn't even mention what's on this podcast, but we don't have to because you already know. You've just been waiting with bated breath for this. Oh, yeah, I'm sure you have. The subject of our podcast. The final two episodes of our commentary for the Doctor Who classic. The Leisure Hive. Yes, welcome back to the final two parts of The Leisure Hive from 1980 season 18, Doctor Who, serial code 5N. Glad you're with us again for these two parts, these two episodes, these two halves, not halves, two quarters. Um, <laughs> we'll call it that. Two yeah. quarters, which will buy you some uh, <laughs> penny whistles and moon pies. I, I was waiting for something Simpsons related. Yeah. Uh, five, I, five Bs for a quarter, they'd say. <laughs> five B is actually the pirate planet. Um, Look, I know. We have yet to do a commentary on it. Yeah, we have yet week. to do. Yeah, we did last week, of course. Uh, you already still have your uh, Blu-rays uh, legally purchased, of course, and DVDs still paused from last week. Well, you may soon unpause them as we watch The Leisure Hive Part 3. Here we go, everyone. The Leisure Hive Part 3 in 3, 2, 1, play. Starfield. Starfield. God, I love <laughs> this. Love this title sequence. The working title for Star Lost. It's interesting that uh, both John Pertwee and uh, Tom Baker had uh, basically the the title sequence that carried their predecessors mm-hmm. through their entire era, for the most part, have happened in their last uh, season. Their last season, yeah. yeah. And then they just used and the it, same one for Colin Baker, yeah. more or less. And Davison, yeah. And, yeah. and it, it it's still, for some reasons, I can sit down, I can watch season 18 stuff, I can see the Tom Baker Starfield thing and... and and it's it's cool and nifty and all that, but I don't really think twice about it anymore. Mm-hmm. But if I sit down and like watch, I don't know, Planet of the Spiders or something, anything season eleven, just seeing the diamond sequence, <laughs> it's weird, the diamond man. tunnel thing from Pertwee looks yeah, so odd. It does seem odd, doesn't it? Out of place. And also, yet with New Who, the the title sequence changes like on a drop of a hat. Yeah, it's too many K- of them. Kudos to the set designer for having those those like ninety degree or whatever uh, doors. They just look so funky. They do, like, and they got to close like perfectly, you know. It's kind of like watching like early Troughton episodes. I know not many exist, uh, but like you know, watching with the old Hartnell opening title sequence. Mm. 
on mm-hmm. a Troughton story with the same like music and stuff feels weird. And of course, the real reason for that is because we're not going to invest in a new title sequence because the show might be canceled. And then they think, ah, <laughs> oh, maybe it'll what maybe it'll carry one? on for a little bit. Let's do what was it was. Was it Macro Terror? Was the first one with the? Uh, you know what? To this day, I get a mix up because the. Uh, Yes, yeah, the back of terror is the first with the titles, but the faceless ones, I think, was the first with the new music. And okay. even then, I think it was like episode two. Like it wasn't even like the first episode. So <laughs> kind of like the Del- kind of like the Delaware theme hit in episode five, just for no good reason in Australia. In, in Australia, I think yeah. episode two as well. But yeah, Rock it, looks like Omar Sharif. It just struck me. He's he a does very, a little very bit. low red Omar Sharif. Yeah. Yeah, now and also yeah. a very short Omar Sharif. Uh, Omar Sharif, Omar was, Sharif, he was he was six foot eight. He was six eight. Omar Sharif. Yeah, yeah and we're gonna find, we're gonna see about that. No, they had to, <laughs> they had to shoot all of his scenes next to Peter O'Toole in like forced perspective in Lawrence uh-huh. of Arabia. Yep. I'm sure they did. And Alec Guinness just stood on a box. That's true, and brown face. Uh, I know. That's I love that movie so much, and yet, <laughs> and yet. Yeah. <laughs> Boom. David Haig uh, was it has been in many things, but he was I loved him in his two episodes five foot of the ten. thick of it. He was five foot ten. Omar Sharif? Yes, he was. How tall was Peter O'Toole? Uh, I'm looking that up too. He was not was he Peter O'Toole? He was not five foot ten. No, he's not. If I had to Six. guess, I'd say five seven at most. Six foot two. Well, Peter O'Toole? Six foot two. Peter O'Toole. He was that tall? Like. Yeah. Yep. Holy cow. We can't all be Tom Cruise. No, no. <laughs> well, I can't. He's the same height as I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, don't know. I think of Peter O'Toole is, is much, much smaller than six foot two. Well, because he's from the, the, the age of short people, <laughs> that, aka the 1960s. You Hollywood know, because... is still short people. No, and there's a good reason for that. I was actually reading about, especially with men, the reason they do that is because you've generally got taller women uh, and you've got guys who it's tough to light and shoot yeah. when people are really mm-hmm. varying in height. So it's best just of to course. find people who are more or less the same height. So you and got you slightly to go taller to women and slightly denominator. shorter guys. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's just it's just convenience more than anything else. There's a like fascinating... If you've got Tom Cruise, who's five foot seven, and you've got a woman who's this co-star who's like, let's say, five foot five, yeah. there's very little work you need to do there. That's what I love about uh, British stuff. You know, like, oh, Matt Smith is like, what, six two, and Jenna Coleman's like five one, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> It did work. It did work better with like you know Matt Smith being that height and Karen Gill- Karen Gillan being what was she five ten? She's five ten. Like yeah, she's very tall. But uh, that, that 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 that's yeah, yeah, yeah. You think you just well, like and sometimes that's saying, modeling too. Yeah. Like when I was went to Comic Con, I've told this story before. And we were interviewing Battlestar Galactic people. Trisha Helfer towered over everybody else because she comes from a modeling time. background, right? And well, then and she all comes the guys from Canada, are like my height or tall. less. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I'm not a tall person i'm like five foot seven most of the guys were about my height yeah i i mean i don't for whatever reason i don't think of like jamie bamber or edward edward james almost as being like tall dudes well jamie bamber opened his mouth and he was speaking british accent i'm like what <laughs> <laughs> i had no I'm idea sorry, james, james callis i'm thinking not jamie bamber that guy, uh, those guys are very Farscape? handsome fellow. His wife is amazing looking. His kids, you can't even look at them. That, that's how beautiful they are. Mm. <laughs> they just emanate light. <laughs> Who, James Kellis? Uh, is that Baltar? Yeah. Yeah, like he was on my flight back from Comic-Con, and him and his wife are just very, very good looking people. <laughs> so. mm. Farscape. I like the uh, wallpaper. I want that wallpaper. It looks like a circuit board, sort yeah. of. Yeah. He's trying to steer this back on topic here, but uh, he's, he's he's hiding out in the panopticon. What the hell is this? He is kind of, isn't he? <laughs> His head is the panopticon. That's it kind of a shot- cool shot, though, where this guy looms in. Yeah, well, it was shots like this, these little one-off shots that Bickford tried to keep cramming in, which kept putting the show uh, over. Kind of great, time. though. I got to say, I have a new appreciation <gasps> for the shooting in this. Yeah, I've when, always when liked he, it. When you think of Studio Doctor Who, mm-hmm. you often think of like just. And it's not just Doctor Who, it's just the way it worked back, or the way it was done back then, but just, just you know, over overly floodlit, bright stuff, and they got that little thing where there's like, you know, a few lights in one small section of the frame, and mm-hmm. just looks so different. It does. I like that these medical people are like, well, I've got white robes with pink dragons. Yeah. And Robin, well, but we don't well, speak because like it's Simpson. the 1980s. Yeah. It's Tracy Simpson. Well, and a... If they spoke, they'd have to pay them. 
Yeah, well, exactly. Uh, so why would we write in women? We already have one. Come on. <laughs> why have I never seen the tachyonic facilities are for research, not fraud on a ribbon? <laughs> <laughs> well, if Gallifrey 1 happens, then uh, you got your chance. Mm. She looks much less green, and Pangle looks more green as things go on. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's... Uh, me seeing things or if that's on purpose just you know aging and whatever but Pangle just looks like the rich kid with a Corvette <laughs> like who just drives around <laughs> without a care in the world thinks he's hot <laughs> oops he's pretty, pardon me he's, he's the Freddy Quimby of that. the story <laughs> yeah, he totally is a Freddy Quimby sorry about that uh, Stephen <laughs> how dare you how dare you I like that we we can never like actually accidentally swear and just move right on we have to apologize no. it for it several seconds <laughs> oh, we are afterwards. Canadian yeah. And the thing is, Canadians love to swear. F oh, yeah. yes, definitely. Oh, l l profanity is the language of sport here. Um, we got the Dr. Romana in a on a bed or by a bed. Ah, clever prime. <laughs> no. See, this here completely disproves Last of the Time Lords. <laughs> Which part? That's true. And so does Time with the Doctor. Uh, it probably turns into Golem for no reason. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, I know oh, some Dobby, Dobby Doctor. Dobby Shut Doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody told me that. And I was like, stop talking about Harry Potter. Just stop talking to me, actually. I don't know much about Harry Potter. Other than I think Doctor Who actors are in it. Uh, from Several. Well, you, they are. Several. Yes. He said Schrodinger hmm. Oscillator. Is that very much, is that like if he didn't open it up, he wouldn't have looked at it or something like that? Is that what that case is? It, is it related to the I think it's just a good cat? throwaway line. Okay. It's just. Using Schrodinger for no good reason, yeah. I'm sure. Tom, Tom Baker does a really good job at playing like old Tom Baker. Is it's fascinating like because a, now Tom Baker is old and now because he's wearing like a support deck pillow thing. He is. He also yes. does a great job of uh, selling lines like the Schrodinger oscillator. That's all. Oh, the only reason so we're great. coming at it is because we read it on subtitles. Yeah. Meanwhile, the yeah. 17th Beatle here. Mm -hmm. It's like when he says Grimblade syndrome. In Robots of Death. Serial code for R. R for look robot. At that, look at that. Like, when do you see blue lighting? Oh, like that, that, look at that shot. Look at the man. depth of focus. Look at that, that depth of focus great. shot. That was awesome. That just, oh, Bickford. I mean. He is great. If you hadn't have, if you hadn't messed up with the money. Oh. And the thing is, I don't particularly enjoy the story. <laughs> but just watching it, not listening to it is great. I yeah, am I know. no fan fantastic. of the story, but wow, it looks gorgeous. I'm a sucker. I mean, I am I will like a well-shot story that's poorly written much more than a well-written story that's poorly shot. I mean, I think it. I think I would still rate it well above Creature yeah. from the Pit. Thing is, most of Doctor Who is a well-written story that's <laughs> poorly shot. So it is. I know. Water. So yeah. when, you, when you see the rare one in those days, it's like, oh, wow, they actually like took some real proper time. Too much time, yeah. uh, as, it, as it turned out. But, uh, but, but it look, stands Look at this out. shot. Look at this shot yeah, coming up great. here. that's great. That's Close even talk. better. Oh. <laughs> this is like Graham Harper-esque here, you know? Like, this is... That's some, that's some close talk in there. Oh, it also reminds me of spinning image a little bit. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Uh... This episode yeah, it feels looks like a middle-aged Douglas Adams. Uh, Douglas Adams sadly never got to middle age. Isn't that tragic? Um, True. <laughs> but he looks like what I surmise that would be. Yeah. I mean, 49, but 49. Good God. I always hated the term middle age because it gets ascribed to people in their late 40s and 50s or whatever. Yeah. You're not going to live to be 110 years old. Well, you're I mean, past you're not gonna middle age at that point. To quote the I mean, brilliant, is not smoking. So to to, to quote the brilliant Chris Boucher, as spoken through the mouth of Villa and Blake Seven, I intend to live forever or die trying. <laughs> it's one of my favorite. Well, I mean, lines I'm ever. I'm 45. I would be classified as more or less middle age. I am way past halfway through my life, and I know. <laughs> wow, that. that's that's a cheery thought. <laughs> Golly, we're having fun tonight, aren't we? Most most of my oh, family has this. died There's pretty like old, so the, yeah. just the just the the. The, the the diffused light coming from the yeah. back. Oh, oh God, this is beautiful. Isn't it though? Look at that. It really Sheets does look great. Stuff. Is it nighttime on uh, Argolis? That's why it's kind of dark. Maybe. <laughs> the Fumasi are offering excellent terms on developer paper for photo for photography, apparently. <laughs> yep. Just gonna put the F stuff in there. I can't remember the terms of uh developing photos. 
No, I can't either. Are you sitting? Oh, look at that. So, so David Haig. I Hague do remember the walked, smell of a development room. I just want to point out that Haig took the document, walked entirely around the set, and had to stop at that exact part so he wouldn't uh, cover up everyone in the scene. I bet you that took 20 takes to get. I love multicam drama for just that very reason. Just because it <laughs> it doesn't rely on editing to make the scene. It relies on performance both of, behind and in front of the camera. It's mm-hmm. just it's so glorious. I mean, not I I, I don't want to belittle uh, camera operators by any stretch of the imagination for for how they work nowadays. But just the skill, I, especially when you think of the size and and whatnot of the cameras that they use to shoot this thing, mm-hmm. I mean, just the the skill involved in. In with the operators and the floor director, just uh, like getting everything where it needs to go when it needs to be there, right on time. Yeah, not too soon necessarily, not too late. And it's it's yeah, it's not it's not just a performance from the actors. It's uh, it's a performance from the camera guys. It really is, you know. And these are these are like you know studio guys. We're just like okay, so one week we're working on Doctor Who, the next week I guess we're doing uh, you know the BBC News or something like that. But they're you know, not just like lazy not, bum but... teamsters or something. They're 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 <laughs> well, giving it their all. Bum well, <laughs> there are some union strife going on, but uh, well, but I'm they are agree. talented. But I mean, you know? they 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 give a crap and they they do a very good job. Yeah, to move that camera on your like, there's no like people like pulling it down a track or anything. It's just a big giant pedestal studio camera swinging around, getting the focus right because you don't have a focus puller. You are working the focus on your own as well. It's uh, it's quite something. Basically, those the, the the studio cameras are essentially Daleks. They had to do everything, move it around, do the focus, do this, do the voice of the camera. I want that on a ribbon too. The studio cameras are essentially Daleks. They really are. I'm I'm in such admiration of them. I, I you know I have very rarely in my early television career, such that it was. Uh, operated um, a studio camera of some sort, even though they weren't nearly as big as these cameras were. And like, it is an art to to uh, to do that. I respect them. It's good. This is <laughs> we we sing the praises of studio camera. Honestly, we should just have a panel of old studio camera operators, and we just say, "You guys are awesome." Look how good this looks too. God, yeah. Dude. Yeah. I mean, it's probably boring as hell, and there's just a bunch of people looking at triangles and everything, but it's great. I love this story. I do like, in the first part, uh, the uh, the rep- reprise at the start, he looks like he actually knows what he's doing operating that triangle computer. Yeah. When it's utter nonsense. <laughs> as all Doctor Who is. Oh, I like even the triangle oh, yeah. uh, security cameras there. Or monopticons, or monoids. Angle. He's a very good actor. The new Argolan. That sounds like a rom- new romantics band. Too. That definitely is a new romantic <laughs> yeah. Child of the Generator is definitely the opening track. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised this never happened before, unless it has. Uh, well, <laughs> calling uh, the band the new Argolan, Child of the Generator. That's awesome. Andrew, Andrew Mark Thompson, get on that. Come on. <laughs> Blown over by Matt. This feels like a joke that uh, that carried over from the the David Fisher season seventeen script. Then, uh, you know, blown over by tachyonics, warp mechanics, rather. It's very Douglas Adams. The rigors of warp mechanics. <laughs> yeah. That would also make an awesome con ripping as well. Hmm. The rigors of warp mechanics. He wasn't, he wasn't ready for them. Yeah. The recre- this is one of those Stephen Moff things where things are hidden in plain sight and you don't really realize until afterwards that, you know, the recreation, Pangles, gen- Pangles recreation, Pangles. recreation generator, generator, recreation. They're recreating. Ah. It's a great song by KMFDM called Juke Joint Jezebel that kind of plays with words in that manner as well. Ooh. I like wordplay. Things like creation and cremation being, you know, so similar but so opposite. Oh, that mischievous doctor. His Santa Claus beard. 
<laughs> you know how much extra chat? they had to pay to get Zoom on their security cameras? Yeah, this is the first time I think that we've ever seen a Doctor Who uh, in a legitimate beard. We don't see it very often. Matt Smith had I a beard right. in uh, mm-hmm. uh, Wedding River Song. Well, the War Doctor had one. Well, he had a, he had a beard. Had one. He had a beard in um, Day of the Moon. Day of the, Day of the Moon. That's what I meant. He was stuck yeah. in the thing as well. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, and that's I'm it. just trying to picture like William Hartnell or, or, you know, anybody, any of the other doctors with beards and it just seems so like, I cannot it's picture odd. Peter Davison with a beard. Like nobody's he, that man, had that one. Man, that man should be permanently baby faced. I know, but I've seen him uh, in a beard with a picture. I, uh, Colin Baker appeared on the Terry Wogan show to promote uh, trial of a time Lord. And he's wearing a beard. Yes. Yes. That's right. That was when yeah. he was. Uh, what about uh, Radagast himself? Yeah. Bird and beard. I almost said bird and beard poop. Beard and bird poop. That's true, McCoy. But McCoy's always in, in like costumes. I always, but never as in Doctor Who though. Never in Doctor Who. I love how crap the Fomasi are. They just look terrible. I they are. It. Yeah, they were supposed to have like the. They were supposed to be like two layers of uh, of fabric that was sort of like replicate like sort of skin, and it was sort of glow under the lights. And of course, it didn't work. And so now they're just sort of like, it's kind of weird. I don't mind them, but the intended yeah, they're, effect. They're, I've seen happened. worse. Yeah. <laughs> I like how the doctor is very, very old man. He's like, get this foreigner away from me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, come here. I'll try to listen to you. No, actually, I have no idea what he's saying. Didn't didn't I vote with a 51% massive majority to have them? <laughs> yes, I believe Fexit was ironclad. <laughs> Fexit. The Fomasi separation initiative. was the box the box of jenna <laughs> of course that could that could be say, like that could be like a kazoo and he puts that face on it he right makes you he believe says, that it's something big yeah. and important uh pretty uh cg abomination tenant plays a pretty great old doctor as well yes um in retrospect, I think I've talked about this before. In retrospect, they should have uh, blurred out his eyes, like they blurred out Mark Gatiss's eyes yeah, in mm-hmm. um, the Lazarus experiment. True. Because you mm-hmm. could tell it's just young David Tennant and an old man. But I, I thought he did a pretty good job anyway. Yeah. Actually, Matt Smith did it too in the end of Time of the Doctor, I thought. That's um, true. Yeah. yeah. Peter a Capaldi. Better, actually. <laughs> Peter Capaldi, of course, because he is older. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to drink that chemical mixture. <laughs> Grabbing his hand and tapping it. That's very much an old person thing, too. Yeah, like, it reminds me of my yeah. grandma. It's fascinating watching actors made up as old people, and then you get the chance to actually look at them as old people. And he, he looks so much similar, but so different. Yeah, I mean, you know, he doesn't have the I hair. I just want the Fomasi and, and the doctor just go to the local bar and just get tanked right about oh, They probably did. <laughs> oh, they probably did in real life. The BBC canteen afterwards. Baker That's a cool moment. It is. Yeah. And that, or that, as, helmet, that helmet's been hanging there the whole time. And yeah. Now it's you, got some you, importance and relevance. You call, it, uh, you call it a cool prop and an outtake from the uh, shooting of a scene. Tom Baker calls it this effing dreary prop. <laughs> wow. Yeah. He gets really angry. I just want to hug you. Uh, <laughs> let's be friends. What? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Must have been some spatial compression. Are they related to the Famasi in any way? I mean, the uh, Slothene, rather. No, uh, no, I don't think no. so. No, okay. The Famasi are less crap. Well, <laughs> honestly, uh, nor, are they? nor are yeah, they related true. to the Blatherine. No, although although I have to say, Boomtown is pretty good. Raxicorical Falipatorians, I suppose, to call them their proper name. Yeah. Martin yeah. Fisk. That's my le- least favorite parts of um, the RTD era is the long names just to amuse RTD. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but then he kind of gets gets you back in um, uh, Love and Monsters where, you know, uh, they mentioned Raxicorical Falipatorius and, and, and um, uh, Peter Kay's, you know, he's just like, no, nah, I'm from Club. Yeah. No, oh, spit on Fair them. Enough. Calm. Yeah. And that northern accent. No, then. Which I butchered. Also, Love right Monsters there. is great. I will brook no dissent. Uh, I know. 
<laughs> I, it's that's 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 one that I, I I and many people just hated first time through, and then man, that it does get better. It does, yeah, because you expect so it to hate better. it. That's the thing. It's that what? How can yeah. you possibly? It's great for so many different reasons. <laughs> yeah, just like the Leisure Hive, right? Right. Well, the Leisure Hive is looking up in my estimation. Well, I expected to be really tediously bored in this. That I'm makes not. me happy. That makes me very happy. Um, well, there's, let's watch. There's still, there's still one big part of, of things to come in episode four that, that just gets my goat when I watch oh. this. Oh, but... well, I can't wait to Good find out what that is. Getting. Yeah, let's mm-hmm. find out. Uh, let's queue up uh, part four of the Leisure Hive then and play it in three, two, one, play. I was going to say it now because I, I might forget to say it at the time. Okay. I mean, it's right. not like anybody listening to this is watching this for the first time because if it is... Your first time watching Leisure Hive. It's Don't ruined. listen to us. Yeah, it's the hell are you doing? Yeah, so um, what is it now? No, when when um, uh, uh, what's his face gets revealed as the Argolan, mm-hmm. and it's like he's so much smaller, both in like girth and height. <laughs> well, that's Argolan. what I mean. That's like, why it just I'm, makes no sense. I'm wondering if if uh, if the Fomasi are relatives of the Raxacorcofalpatorians because they use like spatial compression technology when they're wearing disguises. Uh, you get it? Yeah. Um, not um, not because they look alike, just because of their technology is so... Or they got it from the same discount bin. I don't know, but... Uh... <laughs> Children of the Generator. What is the name of the Black Sabbath song? Children of the Grave, probably. <laughs> I, hope, I hope probably is in brackets. Probably. <laughs> Children of the Gay Drave in brackets. Probably. Yeah. Boo, boo, boo. It's a good song. Shouldn't it's hardest to be translating this uh, for Masi Black Sabbath 3. Well, we hadn't established that as fact in these days. And maybe the, maybe the Tardis didn't know who the Fumasi were. Pretty and sure if, we did. I think Liz Sladen talked about it. And if, if memory serves, there's other stories where, like, the doctor's writing on the TARDIS and chalk here, which he also did. Uh, what are the other stories? Time Monster? No, I'm not Time Monster. Um, time, time Warrior. Warrior. Yeah, Rubish. Oh, okay. Rubish is the Rubish one that's uh, drawing on it. And then, it, yeah. of course, the TARDIS gets painted pink in uh, Happiness Patrol. Yeah. But I, I'm pretty sure, maybe it was just in Target books. I can't remember. Uh, it was supposed to be established that you couldn't write on the TARDIS. Like, it, it would just, like, literally just melt off. Oh, and Briggs the, uh, Briggs yeah. did a nice painting on the TARDIS. That's true. Yeah, the Clara, the Clara yeah. Memorial. Yeah. And then all the uh, the posters on the actually the posters do burn off in the time yeah. vortex and Vincent yeah. the Doctor. So we're in still in reprise territory here for <laughs> Ray <a>, Purchase. Sure, <laughs> he does kind of look like Ray Purchase, doesn't he? From Toast of London. I would not be surprised if Ray Purchase turned out to be a Fumasi. This is oh that was well somewhat less convincing. Yeah, see see this scene here probably took forever because like Bickford like, was going on. Yeah, here? Bickford is lining up all these like reaction shots and like close ups of this and that and like this is not a thing you can really do in a multi cam studio with any. No. There's a lot of cuts. He came up. To, he came up to the editor and he's like, um, uh, I got something to tell you. Yeah, <laughs> like, and he ain't gonna like it. <laughs> yep. I mean, at least at least it's something he could do on, like, say, in the '60s, where they could have two cuts per episode. Yeah. <laughs> or they, you know, where they well, even in um, it's fascinating actually watching the uh, uh, raw studio footage for Earthshock. Like, still, how many of the effects and like are in camera still at that point? Like, they would do gallery effects on like a day, but if they could get away with it, they would just do everything in camera, and that flurry of cuts there was obviously done in post-production i assume if they managed to do that with a vision mixer cutting between five different or six different cameras i would have been very impressed but that little reaction shot to uh, david haig is probably like you know i'm thinking that some of those shots aren't shot at the same time as the main scene here I love analyzing. <laughs> I love analyzing multicam <laughs> drama. Let me tell you, it is one of my favorite hobbies. I think you need hobby to or obsession or both. No. Yeah, yeah. So, forget the pandemic. I, think I was need, doing this before the pandemic. More. That's a sad thing. Yeah, I think a really nice day, but I kind of wanted to sort of analyze the 
how many cameras they used in a particular scene. I remember yeah. once being told off because it was a nice day out in Edmonton. <laughs> Fair enough. Mm. Uh, and I went to see a movie instead, and I was told how crazy it was. Well, the joke's on you now, isn't it? But the yeah. movie theater's probably <laughs> air-conditioned and nice and nice and cool. To be fair, how many nice days does Edmonton get? Six. A few, yeah. Actually, we've had, nice. a few, uh, we've had a few good ones this week. Yeah, define Hangler, nice. you're such a dick. He is very bad. <laughs> <laughs> I like how those imprisoned Fomas, you just, oh, just let's go off to the ship now. They got us fair and square. Packing quilt. Yeah. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, it's always awkward when you know actors are walking towards a camera like where did they have to split at some point tilt. so yeah. they don't walk into it and they both sort of took their uh, left or right he looks like an entitled fan uh, which one him yeah Pangle, Pangle. oh well, you can't possibly make that cannon. Well, why not? <laughs> Ian Levine was not consulting yet. Uh, I don't think he was. When was his... I mean, he's never officially there. When was his first... Uh, Sayward came on. Yeah. Probably by coincidence. Ah, Mirror Law and our old friend. <laughs> Finally used as an in-camera set. Random fuel frame makes no sense. If Pangles tech tech tech, he's tech in a tech. Mm hmm. Blather blather. I can't see blather. where I that. I don't even know what it means. <laughs> Agu tech tech. Is Doctor Who going to regenerate? <clears throat> we didn't know that he was going to regenerate. I think his uh, departure was announced October 24th. 1980. I was a little worried when I watched this that he would regenerate, though. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know what regeneration was when I first saw this. I just thought he was Doctor Who forever. And Modify the oscillator. I believe that's the B side of uh, the <laughs> Child, Children of the Generator. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere, somewhere out in the world, Chris Pitney just cracked a smile and he doesn't know why. <laughs> <laughs> like, like he woke up right now, woke up in the middle of the night. Pangle the Hated is their rock ballad. Yeah. It was a sacred symbol, the symbol of our shame. The helmet of Theron is a garbage. Helmet of Theron. Of course, named after Charlize Theron. Um, yes, yes. Well, she did worship the God of War. She is uh, awesome. Whenever somebody refers to themselves in the plural, you got a problem. Yeah. I quite liked uh, Atomic Blonde and, of course, Mad Max Fury Road. Charlie Theron stars in both. I have not seen Atomic Blonde yet. Oh, it's good. Good. There's a fight sequence in that movie, which is stunning. Speaking yes. of uh, well-made yes, uh, camera work and stuff. You would appreciate I, it, Warren. Uh, I don't think I've seen the Charlie Theron thing I haven't liked her do. Yeah, yeah, I, I can't even a bad movie she's been in, to be honest with you. Well, I'm sure even, they're even like Even her turn in the rest of the development was awesome. Oh, oh probably true, yes. I haven't seen as but much as... She's great in Monster. Oh, yeah, it won an Oscar. Yeah, yeah. Won an award for Norway, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, Mad Max Fury Road. Mad Max Fury Road is just one of the greatest films ever How made. How many times did you see that in the theater? Like five? Only once, only once. Only and once? Because I couldn't, I couldn't top that experience. I, I didn't watch it again for quite a while because I, I was worried that it would not live up to that initial experience seeing it. And I watched it again the night it won a whole bunch of Oscars, but not, sadly, Best Picture. And I thought, oh, my God, this is the greatest film. It is phenomenal. Oh, it's just a stunning film. I I need to watch that again at some point. Oh, I I own uh, I own the uh, the black and chrome version. It came out as <laughs> Tom Baker hiding behind a thing. <laughs> And never, and he gets he gets away with it. And he just ah, oh, whatever. The, well, the mannequin's moving now, I guess. It's his coat more more or less matches the color of the. the hey, yeah. it's back! It's the hand from Pyramids of Mars, <laughs> or Hand of Fear, uh, or both. Hmm. 
Mina's Revenge, the sequel to Bram Stoker's Dracula. Adrian Corey here was in um, Clockwork Orange. I did not know that. Yep. In a scene that I'm going to call the singing in the rain scene. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. Oh, was that yeah. her? That was good. She that was, was her, the, uh, the unfortunate victim, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, if you're going to... If you're gonna have a, a giant white rocking phallus in your thing in your house, then I mean, they here's my take. I love Kubrick. I, I love everything he does, um, or did. But and it's, it's Clockwork Orange is a good film. But when somebody tells you it's their favorite, you run away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I often rank Full Metal Jacket as one of my top three films ever. Really? Yeah. Uh-huh. Two thousand one is best. Two thousand one is my favorite is film of all time. I think Eyes Wide Shut is unfairly crapped upon. Yeah, uh, is as good as other ones. No, is it what, amazing looking. Yes. Yeah. Two thousand. I tell you what. Unfairly. Speaking of, I, I was talking about Mad Max. Like I was w- worried about seeing it again because I feel like it, it would have diminished uh, between viewings. Uh, I hadn't. I didn't watch like two thousand one for like years, and then it came to theaters in town and I would see it oh, like I was scared oh no I, am I just like coasting on the memory of it and just sort of like I, you know I want to be like a film school nerd and thus I have to call it the best film no it's, it's yeah. my favorite film no yeah I went to see it for the first time in the theater oh, uh, when it came to town it is amazing yeah. looking it looks it's so good and it's 50 stunning. what more than 50 years old it's, it's more insane. than 50 years old it's 1968 and still to this day like any science fiction film is still trying to like just be 2001 in the it yeah it's and, and even the ape stuff which I hated when I was a kid now I'm like this is kind of the best part yeah <laughs> it's really interesting <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, in the late nineties uh, the um, oh what the heck is the name of that uh, the theater downtown uh, that that got Paramount converted into a church Paramount yeah. I remember going to the Paramount Theater once upon a time in the nineties <laughs> to watch like a, oh. a midnight Saturday screening of Clockwork Orange first time I'd ever seen it. Oh. And the the print they had was so grainy and torn and just such trash that it just like I, it was tough to watch that. I film. saw mm-hmm. I saw a midnight screening of Caligula at the Paramount. And <laughs> let me tell you, you don't need to see the movie that big. You just don't. No, <laughs> no. My, when and, I was and the in thing um, is, that's a bad, 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 bad film. But it goes by pretty quick for a bad film. Weirdly mm-hmm. enough, never tried watching it. Uh, when I lived in in London, uh, the the nearest cinema to me did a lot of like older. Uh, rescreenings of older films, and I saw Spartacus there, the the one and only Spartacus time I've seen great. it. And that 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 looks beautiful on the big screen. Oh, it's yeah. I remember when they restored it, and they I think it was ninety three that came out. I remember seeing it with my dad because he saw it in the theater back in the day. We all, me, Ooh. my sister, and my dad went to see Spartacus. And I'm like, this is the greatest episode of Star Trek I've ever seen. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor Who's playing on here. I appreciate our film talk, but uh, yeah, that's yes. about true. There Cooper rules and Dove. <laughs> Yeah, although uh, most of those Kubrick films uh, sort of uh, are similar to this in that they have a speaking role for one woman. Um, yeah, that's uh, fair. As and much also, as, this is some pretty good video effectory. Here. As much as I love films from the 1970s, boy, it's not, it's not a, a, not a good Linden, time for... Barry Lyndon does not have much for female speaking roles. No. <laughs> Lolita, we, uh, despite just being about a woman, does yeah. not... We, I don't know when this is coming out, but as of like two days ago from recording of this, we went to see Raiders of the Lost Ark at the drive-in because that's the only place you can see a movie anymore. Yeah. Um, and that, A, that film obviously still holds up. It's fantastic. But B, that's one of the two examples, both of them George Lucas, I have to point out, where uh, women are the, just kicking ass all over the place, or at least a woman in the film is. Yeah, the one woman, you mean? The one woman in the film. <laughs> yeah, but also she's but she, no she makes violence. up for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Also, it is 1981, and yeah, okay, there should be more, and there should be probably yeah. female in Jan Jones by this point. But also given pr- all that, uh, also a pretty notable uh, instance of yellow face in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, that's true. Everyone dumps on Talons of the Wang Chiang, and wait, rightly so. But and uh, rightly so. <laughs> the fascinating thing is that there uh, I, was it Malcolm Walker, I think, is the guy who's like wearing basically a similar prosthetic to what uh, John Bennett was in Talons of Wang Chiang. As recently as last year, the London Film and uh, Film and Comic Con was promoting Malcolm Walker. Or I can't remember his name, his appearance, and used a picture of him in that makeup as like, oh, you remember him? He's from Raiders of Lockup. Like, imagine if John Bennett was alive today and we thought, hey, John Bennett's coming on. Here he is in that makeup that he was in in the towns of oh, Wang Chai. We'd be yeah, dumping no, on bad him. idea. And they use it. Oh, stunning. Just stunning. Anyway, uh, here's uh, 
<laughs> Doctor Who <again. laughs> <It's a> Leisure <laughs> Hive. <laughs> we have this has been a whipsaw of emotion. A little bit, a little bit of uh, just to give you an indication of the era that we're we're in here in uh, 1980. Uh, another another instance. Um, Britbox just added all the uh, BBC classic B- uh, Shakespeare plays from the late seventies, early eighties, and uh, that one features Anthony Hopkins, blackface, and Othello. So that's nineteen eighty one. There's so one th- I remember seeing as a kid, well, as a kid, as a student in yeah. junior high. Oh, uh, Tom Baker. Uh, and it was, and it was the guy who played Ford Prefect in David in, Dixon. Uh, in, yeah, that he's in it. And, uh-huh. and, I, and I said, because I was the only person in class who never watched the Chicken <laughs> of the Galaxy on PBS, hey, it's David Dixon. And people were like, shut up, nerd. Right. And I was like, yeah, fair. It's a great shot here. Father of Dan Aykroyd's wife, Donna Dixon. Uh, is it really? No. No. Isn't not. she the one? No. No. For some reason, I was conflating her with Casey, uh, Casey Kasem's abusive wife. Because oh, wow. they're both tall blondes. Jerry Hall? Uh, no, no Jerry Hall was not married to Nick Casey Kasem. Jagger. <laughs> anyway, Tom Baker is young again uh, for the first time since the cliffhanger of uh, all, episode two. All of them. Oh, yeah. All of the yeah. Tom Mid-40s. Bakers are young. Yeah. Tom Baker <laughs> is slightly younger than you are now in this, Warren, if that makes any sense. Yeah, well. I think he's 47. Very youthful looking then. Seven? No, he's 46. You turned 40. No, he's 47. I can't remember now. All the Tom Bakers are young and all the Gateways 46. are one. 46. 46 years old. He turned 47 on January 20th, 1981. Crap. That's our age, dude. That's our age. Yeah, well, I'm a little older than that. This is Now, does he kill him or does he just like... What or maybe that's how you like you sort of like knock out an Argolan is to sort of grab him by the neck for seven seconds. Evoke a neck pinch. That's Ar- doesn't have Vulcan ring of the nerve pinch. pinch. Yeah. Well, you can learn it from Vulcans. Yeah. In his travel mm-hmm. to a parallel world. I mean, Vulcan was in Doctor Who before it was in Star Trek. It was that's true. Tech- so was the Matrix before the Matrix. When was mm-hmm. when did the planet Vulcan actually uh, appear in Star Trek? Well, he's referred to as a Vulcanian in the pilot. Oh, gross! Really? Oh, wow! Yeah, uh, where he's yelling a lot. But the planet, the planet itself hadn't. I mean, you know, because power of the Daleks. You don't see didn't... it until a muck time. Uh, like you don't aren't there on Vulcan. Oh yeah, uh, and that's six season, season, season maybe two, the right? Second, yeah, yeah, I think really season two. And Star Trek didn't actually show up in the UK until sixty nine. Um, so it's a pure coincidence that Doctor Who had uh, the, the name Vulcan as the planet in power of the Daleks in the late sixty six. So kind of on the Star Trek tip, there's the, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the teleporter thing where some people posit that because the, the, the transporter, you know, disassembles and reassembles you that you're not the same person when you reassemble. Ah, uh, the wipe again. There the, it is. Um, yep. The same, the same could be possibly, um, you know, posited here with Tom Baker's doctor and the generator and all that. Hmm. It's a good question. Good point, actually. So this uh, is FIFO Tom, stack. This ah, is Tom yeah. Baker four point five. <laughs> this is basically I basically the watcher comes out. Like the wa the the old doctor is still in the generator somewhere in the form of the watcher now. And uh, that's, that's why it's a good fan theory. Yeah. I love also, that. Also FIFO stack is start. total bid mead wank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh this is the obvious one. Like Baker actually has to lift his coat up and drag it over the camera for the Yeah, it's still great though. For the cut, yeah. I love those wipes. He such he said he's just a whiny kid now, basically. It's kind of like his Donald Trump Jr. here, like just crying out. <laughs> Why are you so mean to my dad? Oh yeah, yeah he's a colossal jerk. <laughs> Don't make me sorry. Sit you back again. and yeah, and then, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a big comedian. I think I said it for rejuvenation. Put it um, in H. Yeah. Implosion. What? <laughs> All the Argolans are one. Ah, here's the effing dreary prop scene right here. That they only shot once because they ran out of time. That was shot immediately before the claw that lights went out in the studio. That shot of him throwing it. Too bad he wasn't a baby for Masi. That's bringing <laughs> the racist together. Yeah. That is a young Matt Smith, by the way. <laughs> no. Matt Smith wasn't even born yet. He was born in 1982. Nope. Yeah, October 28th, 1982. 
Yeah, the, West, a, the West the West Lodge when I was watching Doctor Who. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> just I love that little cut of uh Lala Ward there. I like seeing the doctor hold a baby and being very confused. Yeah. <laughs> do you speak baby here, Tom? Or do you, is this is why you learn <laughs> baby. <laughs> Are you I love also how... Stormageddon Dark Lord of All. Yeah. <laughs> like just have a baby. Have a baby. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want because we're we're watching this with no uh, audio on. I've turned my audio on ever so slightly up. The music crescendo from Peter Howell into the end of the episode that leads directly into the closing credits is my favorite of all time. I love that he refers to the Black Guardian as some hobo with ideas about the station. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Like basically just I I remember he was in this? Yeah. Dismiss the entirety of the randomizer. Oh, whatever. Written out. Well, the well, random. I mean, they brought Clara back. Yeah, that's. It wasn't written out so much as it was used with the for the Doctor Who. Order. Good old Doctor Who. Yeah. Yep. Last season of that till it came back in two thousand five. David Haig. So with that, that leaves uh, what Peter Davison and David Tennant, I think, were the only two actors credited as both the Doctor and Doctor. No, because all the actors who were in Five Doctors were the Doctor. Because mm. uh, Davison's credited as the Doctor from Castro Valley. What about onwards. in Day of the Doctor? Uh, uh, Doctor Who? Probably Dur Dot Who, actually. Oh, Day of the Doctor? No, it's all um, the Doctor. I, feel I do love like, how they run through all the doctor faces. Yeah. Oh, Duncan, Duncan Brown. Doctor, Duncan, Duncan Brown did the uh, the lighting, and and he was uh, really good with Genesis of the Daleks back in the day. So this it's no surprise that the lighting was so good in this because Duncan Brown's a really good uh, lighting director. Yeah, the lighting in Genesis is pretty great too. Yeah. Well, that was uh, that was lovely. I love it. Love <laughs> like love it, Bickford. That's what I always say when it comes to Leisure Hive. It <laughs> bend it like Bickford. That's right. <laughs> yes. Just like that. Uh, Budget hope, it like Bickford. <laughs> yeah, I said go over. Uh, I hope everyone uh, enjoyed uh, the Leisure Hive with us. Uh, Warren, I hope you enjoyed it more than you thought you would. I was pleasantly surprised. Well, that makes me happy. Mostly because it's nerding out of her shots, but yeah. That's the thing. <laughs> this, is great. this is the thing about doing commentaries. If it's a wordy story and we're doing a commentary on it, it's going to be tough to commentate because everyone's just talking. But if we have neat, fun angles and lighting effects and we don't have to worry about the dialogue, it's great to talk over and mention films from the 1970s as we're wont to do but um <laughs> yeah sure man. and singing in the rain scenes <laughs> yes singing in the rain scenes uh yeah no, not so much no uh so let's uh let's select the next uh classic series commentary that we'll do we might not do too many of these more of the uh, who knows we'll see what 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 the year <laughs> yeah. plays out as but uh the year 2021 yeah. the year of death um uh ooh, little, a little a little soon there a little yeah. dark I agree. um so chris you got the uh the, the randomizer uh ready to go there to select the uh, the next fired story. up ready to go okay begin oh, it. very nice very nice 2012 reference <laughs> uh begin <laughs> the spinning of it now yeah, I say classic series commentary. Of course, we've uh, we've thrown. We have in... added the stuff that we haven't done from the new series as well. Yeah, first. most of the series yeah. two and uh, all of series ten that we haven't done commentaries for. So just to yeah. just to keep it keep it interesting, you know. But uh, but as we said, there are still four of the six stories from the key to time just waiting, waiting <laughs> to be found, like the One Ring. Uh, see if we get one of those or whatever we'll get. We'll find out right now. <gasps> Stop. Um, well, we're going to keep some bid mead, uh, Frontios. <laughs> I just said I hated Frontios. Oh, what? <laughs> what? We... Okay. We're going to do all the bid meads. All the bid meads are one and we're doing Frontios, eh? <laughs> we're doing Frontios. Hmm. All right. Well. <laughs> who and indeed who. I still, I still remember, I'll still probably talk about it when we do it, but I remember as a kid for the first time I see, I, I saw Frontios. Yeah. Um. I, I fell asleep for the last little bit of the story and I had no idea how the TARDIS <laughs> got back together for like you missed ever. Nothing. You did, missed nothing at all. Did you miss anything though? Do we ever find out why it got blown up with the... Well, <laughs> well maybe we'll try and under, <laughs> uncover all that when we watch Frontios, uh, directed by Ron Jones, which guarantees we will not have the, <laughs> vis quality. the visual stimuli that we had with the Leisure Hive. Uh, all right. Frontios, everyone. Frontios. 
<laughs> the story that came before Resurrection of the Daleks, and that mm-hmm. was known as the... I loved Resurrection of the Daleks as a kid, and when it came around again, I couldn't wait for it. I said, ooh, this week is Frontios. I just have to endure this, and then it's time for Resurrection of the Daleks. I, 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 I did the same thing with the Time Monster, knowing that the week after was going to be the three doctors. So. <laughs> yeah, so... These are all legit. Well, hope you'll join us for that. Hope you'll help us through that, uh, <laughs> Frontios, on the uh, next commentary, uh, classic series commentary here on Radio Free Scarl. Uh, until the next episode, though, I am Stephen in Edmonton. Part of Vancouver. And Chris in Edmonton. So long for now. <laughs> You've been listening to Radio Free Scaro. Find us online at radiofreescaro.com. Follow us on Twitter and Tumblr at Radio Free Scaro. Subscribe to us on iTunes and donate to the show at patreon.com forward slash Radio Free Scaro. Thank you. Radio Free Scaro.